Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, Giulio Tiozzo is going to give his uh, third talk, I guess. Yeah. I believe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks for coming. The third day in a row at 9.30. So good morning. Okay. So as I announced yesterday, today I will discuss... Uh, as, as with as much detail as time allows, some, uh, the, the proof of this new identification uh, method for the Poisson boundary, and this, this is the main result. Let me write it in this setting. So let, yeah, so as I mentioned yesterday, maybe I'll still credit my authors. So the thing is, we will only look at hyperbolic groups today for simplicity, and the proof could be adapted for groups with a WPD action. Uh, so this, the, there is a little more than that, but okay. So let mu be a finite entropy. Generating Um, probability measure on a infinite, let's say, not virtu non virtually cyclic, so these are all non elementary hyperbolic group G. So then the graph of boundary boundary G equipped with a heating measure, which we know it exists because of this non-elementary measure with heating measure. Is is a model of, for is the Poisson boundary of this group with this measure. And let me just recall generating new, generating, this is the standard assumption when we deal with Poisson boundaries to avoid uh, some uh, unpleasantness. So is that the semi-group generated by the support, so you take semi-group generated is the whole group. Yeah. The fact that this is a semi-group and not a group is not completely, I mean, it's slightly thorny issue, but more or less this is the standard. Okay, so, so what are the ingredients? So first of all, I have to start talking about entropy theory. which of course was already uh, very much uh, important in the earlier versions of this theorem when you had the moment condition. So for instance, in the work of Hermanovich. Okay, so first of all, what is the entropy of a measure? Well, so if mu is a measure on G, the entropy of just one measure is just minus the integral of log mu G. So this expression, since we are in countable setting, and okay, we, we assume this to be finite. And then we have all bunch of notions of entropies of related things. So, so first of all, there's the Avet's entropy or asymptotic entropy, which is given, which is, let's call it small h. And this is given by take the nth step convolution of mu with itself, divided by n. So what is this n step convolution? Well, you can, we remember that we, we defined a convolution operator yesterday or more simply mu n of g is just the distribution of the n step of the random walk. So the probability that w n equals g. Yeah, let's recall the setting, the notation is that we, we write the random walk as w n g1 g2 
gn. So gi's are always the increments and w's are the final word. So that was the notation that we chose with Joseph back then. Okay. So, so, so this is already a very interesting uh, invariant of a random walk. And in fact, the most important theorem maybe in this theory is the entropy criterion. In the, fir the first case, and so this is due independently to Kamanovich and Vershik in the 80s. And also even slightly less known, but at the same time, Rosenblatt. Which simply says the following. So if the entropy of the whole walk is finite, then the asymptotic entropy is zero if and only if the boundary is trivial. So some boundary is trivial. So this is a very clear um, identification problem. Like, uh, yeah, so, so that's it. So somehow the idea is that the random walk does not carry enough information to, to further split this, this boundary. So we will see that when the boundary is non-trivial, you can separate this the space of paths in a different um, subset according to where they converge. And this somehow lowers the entropy. But if, if there's already zero entropy, you cannot split it further. And so the, the boundary is, has to be trivial already. So, however, what we care about uh, to, for the identification rather than for the triviality is the relative version of, of this. And so to do that, we need to define relative notions of, of entropy. So in general, also that more generally, so if you have rho a partition, rho i, some countable partition of the path space. So remember that the path space was always indicated as omega at the measure p. Well, we can First, uh, we can denote the entropy of the partition as well, the same thing. Not mu, but p. p was the probability. Well, p. So i. So this is more general. So because uh, we can combine not just one random variable, but several random variables in some weird, even sometimes complicated way. And we can still assign a notion of partition and we can assign a notion of entropy. And so what are the two important partitions? So the, mo the most important partition is the following that, um, so we say the two sample paths WN and WN prime are AN equivalent. So this is partition that we're gonna call AN, simply if the n step of one walk is the same as the end step of the other walk. So of course, this is a sequence of partitions that depends on n. And this is uh, extremely important because we know that the entropy of the an partition, well, is nothing else that the entropy of the n step convolution, because we are just looking at the distribution of the n step. So this is h of mu n and so forth. So, so this is the first partition that we're gonna look at. And in general, whenever you have a boundary, how can you tell whether this is the Poisson boundary? So recall that we know that, um, for instance, we know that the, the random walk yeah, so the random walk almost, almost surely converges to some point on the graph of boundary. So this is psi. And of course, so this and so the 
Gramov boundary with the Hitton measure is what we called yesterday a mu boundary. Because there is a map from the set of infinite paths to, to this boundary, and this is invariant by shift. And the, the goal of, of all this entropy theory is to figure out. Yeah, is to show that this boundary, which is given by the geometry, is maximal, is the biggest possible among new boundaries. Hence, the Poisson bound. So let's uh, think about if you yeah if you remember from yesterday. So we saw that the Poisson boundary is the maximal possible mu boundary. In fact, every other mu boundary is a quotient of it. This is more or less by definition, and we are given by geometry, by nature, if you will, we are given a boundary with a measure in it, and we really want to prove that there is no further quotient of it. I mean, sorry, that this is the maximal one, that this is not a quotient of, of something else. And so, so what is the idea? Well, the idea is that you cannot spread apart this uh, walk more. So, and so, so the way you, you, you phrase this is the following. So you, you fix a boundary point, and then you look at all paths that converge to this. So there's a bunch of, there need not be only one path, of course, that converges there. But the idea is that if you cannot split this boundary point further apart, well, this is, for instance, because the process which is conditioned at stopping at converging here has no entropy. So if it has no entropy left, it means that you're, you're, uh, you're, you reach the, the end. You cannot further split it from a measurable point of view. So this, there, there's a relative version of this criteria. So you can think of the, the random walk starting with some finite amount of entropy on the whole group, and then you further split it and split it, and the entropy goes down. And at the end, if you converge to this point, there should be once you choose the boundary point, you're, you still have maybe several paths that converge there, but there's not too many of them that don't carry much. So the idea, again, is that the set of paths converging to some particular site, so condition on hitting the site, has zero entropy. Hence, you cannot further split the boundary points. OK? And so now, let, let's, let's uh, any questions? So this is a, not so trivial, but <laughs> Get, one needs to get used to it. Yeah, any questions? So, okay, so what is the formal way of defining this? Well, the formal way is to look at the relative entropy criteria. So this is an absolute entropy criteria. So what would the relative version of this? Okay, so in general, we, we talk about conditional entropy. Okay, so we start with the mu boundary. So we take B uh, new, B a mu boundary. And so this means that there is a map pi from the space of infinite paths to this boundary. And we can disintegrate the measure according to the place where you're hitting the boundary. So 
by this integration, yeah, so exists new almost every, for new almost, for new almost every psi, for new almost every psi, a probability measure, p psi, such that p would be the integral of p psi, d new psi. And the way you think about it is you look at all the points that converge to this psi. And so this is a subset of the space of all sample paths. And so there is an induced distribution. Of course, so this is no longer a random walk because if you con condition at heating at xi at infinity, well, the increments are no longer independent and in iid because well, you have some, there's some force that somewhat pushes you to converge there. And in fact, you can write the law of that conditional process, but I will, I will not need it, so maybe I will not do it. But I will talk about the notion of conditional entropy that you can find. So in general, what, what you can define again, if you start with the partition, we define the conditional entropy, condition and hitting psi of this partition. Yes? This is, no, well, no, no, this is an integral on the boundary, right? So, so. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the, 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 yeah, the domain is B, the target is the space of measures. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, right, so, so yeah, so, so when we have such measures, conditional measures, you can know, define a notion of conditional entropy. This is, you know, it's a strange. And, and then we, we just take given, the conditional entropy of conditional entropy of this partition row given the boundary B. Well, this is just the integral of all these um, entropies on this process. So you define it HB of rho is just the integral over B of a, a shark psi of rho d nu. Okay. So we take all this relative entropies and we take the average of them. And this gives you a number which is associated to, to your boundary. Yes. Relate to what? Yeah, this is just a definition. So two paths are in the same AN equivalence class if they're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's an equivalence class and so it defines a partition. That's all, that's all. So far I didn't say anything really insightful. <laughs> yeah, so this will, will play a role immediately. You can already tell here that somehow uh, right, so this entropy here enters in this criterion, and then there will be a relative version that enter, enters in the relative criterion. Okay. Okay, and so fun a note or exercise, if you will, <laughs> is that the, ent the conditional entropy is less than the original entropy. So for any partition, so if I start with the original entropy, and first I condition on the boundary and I integrate over boundary points, this is less or equal. Why? Have you ever thought about this? What? It is less information, it makes sense. But, and yeah, and mathematically, why, why, why does it make sense mathematically?
yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's related to Jensen's inequality. It's a convexity of the of the, of the log function. And so this is one of the reasons why we use log in the definition of entropy. There's two reasons. One is that, which of course this will be satisfied by other things as well. And the second one is you, you want to have that you, if you have two independent processes, you take the entropy, the joint of, of the product, and then, then you get the sum of the entropy. So, so yeah, so this is uh, just a Jensen's inequality. It's a good exercise. Okay, and as I said, so so the so the relative entropy criterion could be formulated in different ways. So let me tell you in uh, two ways. I'll write it here. So we write this is a relative entropy criterion, okay? So basically this is due to Kamenovich in the, and there's some, some slightly epsilon improvement that we introduced in the paper with Forkani, which I will write the second formulation. But so the, yeah, under the conditions, again, if H mu is finite and B mu is mu boundary. Okay, then B mu is the Poisson boundary, so it's maximal. If and only if the entropy, the asymptotic, this Abbott's entropy of the conditional random walk is zero for mu almost every psi. This makes sense is exactly what I said. So you condition to hit this boundary point. And by the way, so for instance, if you take the wrong compactification, for instance, you start with the free group, you take the one point compactification. <laughs> well, the walk originally has positive entropy. And it, you know, if you take that, well, of course, uh, you still have the same entropy on the boundaries, so of course, so this is not the, the correct uh, boundary. And so you have to, Further split these points apart, and in fact, turns out they, are, they can be split according to this limiting point. And so this is also related to these uh, harmonic functions that we uh, constructed this, okay? Okay, uh, so this is one formulation, uh, but we will uh, use, in fact, uh, even a slightly different formulation. Yes? That's not true, but it's a good point to, 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 to say, because it's true that the entropy of a partition row is less or equal the log of the cardinality of the partition, again, by Jensen's inequality. So in fact, in most cases, when you want an upper bound, this would be the easiest thing to do. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so if the random walk, for instance, if it's finitely supported, it's very easy to bound entropy this way. In principle, of course, remember that when you have a measure, if the weights are not all the same, you can get lower entropy. If you set all weights to be the same, then you get examples. And we will actually very much need this, so it's, it's a good question. Okay, and so uh, some more slightly global version of this is the following. So we define H, H of B nu, and this is the limit as n goes to infinity of this relative entropy, Hb. So we take the relative ones, we integrate, and we take the a n partition, and we divide by n. So this is almost integrating this over xi, except there's an exchange of order of integration. So there is something to be taken care of. But then the, the second criteria is that yeah, that B nu is the Poisson boundary is equivalent to this H B nu to be zero. Yeah, so 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 this one is is, is somehow yeah also comes from 
earlier work of Kaimanovich, it's written precisely in my other paper with the Hong. Yes. Okay, so So that's what we want to do. We want to prove, basically, that this relative entropy is. And now the second thing, uh, yeah, so how, how do we do it? And so the second thing is, yes? Just tells you the nth step. Just, just, AN just tells you if I know what is the nth step, how much information is contained, in just knowing the end step, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that is also true. But I mean, this is very easy. This is just uh, the end step. You, you don't need other information here. Yeah, yeah of course, so this is the bottom boundary is, is very much related to, to this uh, tail sigma algebra. Yes, yes. Okay, so so the second thing we we so instead of in the old uh, all the criteria you uh, yeah the entropy identification was usually done by the strip approximation. So now we come up with a different uh, version of this, which we call the pin down approximation. And the idea can be understood, uh, yeah, without going too, too, too technical first, and then we will go in this more, more tech. Thing. So the, the idea here is the following. So suppose there exists some, part, some sequence of partitions, Pn, and suppose you know the following two things. So one is, if I condition, so basically this is some additional information. So what do we know about our random walk? So we know that it converges to this point psi, and we want to show that basically there is no other invariant that, no, that we can use to tell things about. So, so basically we want to show that we can pin down the end step of the walk up to certain in certain way, once you fix this boundary. So now, suppose there is some additional information that we, we can check along the way, and we encode this in these partitions. And we have the two following things. One is if we condition on knowing this information, so we know this additional information, and we still want to know what do we know about the end step of the walk. And again, and also we condition on hitting this boundary point. And suppose that we know this is small o of n. And then we also know, suppose, that this information that we add really doesn't add much entropy. So for instance, suppose that this information, the entropy of this partition is also o. And in fact, we can assume this, we can just take the integral, forgetting about the boundary, just as an as an abstract partition. So suppose we have these two things, then clearly we know that HB of a n divided by n goes to zero. And well, the reason for that, it's simple because, you know, this, if we add this information, so, right, so, we can always add some information. So it means we take the join with this other partition. And then, okay, this is by definition is, well, the relative entropy, once you condition on, on, on Pn plus the entropy of Pn. <laughs> and then what? Well, once you, once you have this, well, so we know that, so this is HB of AN given PN and by N plus, and this we can forget by this convexity, we can forget about B and we get. So this seems like an esoteric calculation at the moment, but I will show you a simple example first. 
So, so then this would go to zero and this would go to zero. This would be by one. This would be. So if we, if we know, so basically what happens? We know where the walk is converging and it's converging to this point psi. And along the way, we can keep track of something else. Of course, we cannot keep track of all the increments because if we did keep track of all the increments, that it would be perfect. We would immediately tell where the walk is, but then the entropy would be too big. <laughs> so we want to add a little bit of information, but this information has to have low additional uh, entropy. And if that, the two things are, are the case, well, then really this, this conditional entropy of the nth step has to, has to go to zero as a way. Okay, so this is, so this is an abstract of what is the spin down method is, which we, yeah, this, we sort of came up in this earlier paper with Berang, and let, let me show you an example where it's much easier to understand. Yeah, and what I want to say, the pin down idea is that if you are given this additional information, you can pin down the, the location of the walk. This is, <laughs> this is the pin down idea, yes. So, okay, so, so let, let me do an easy example, so the toy example. So consider a measure mu on the free semi-group in two generators. So there is no, uh, you know, backtracking or anything like this. Okay, so what do we need? To pin down the answer. So of course, of course, the boundary, the, the boundary that you think about is, well, the space of reduced words. Well, not reduced because everything is monoid. So yeah, just infinite words. Words. There is no, there is no inverses, so there is nothing to reduce. Just, just a cancel set. Okay. So what information can I give you? to tell you where you are. So, so suppose I know that the random walk converges to this psi. So this is given, so given, so we given a boundary point. So what other information would it be useful to know, to really know where we are at the end step? Well, in this case, there's an easy thing you can do. What if I give you the distance from the origin? Suppose I give you this uh, dn, the distance from the origin. Okay, so I, I give you xi, so xi pins down already the geodesic, because it's a free group. I give you also the distance, then you're done, because there is uh, nothing else, to no, no choice. So you know that you just walk along the geodesic, and you know that wn has to be here. So this is the easiest case. So in this case, we define Pn. Yeah, so Pn is given by, uh, I will write maybe some symbol like this to say that it's given by this, this random variable. So Dn, which is the distance between O and Wn. By, whenever I have a random variable, I can think about the partition, which is just given by the ray images. Maybe I'll, I can write this somewhere. This is pretty standard, but right. So we can write P is given by a random variable X. This means that P is given by the three images X inverse of A, yeah, where A is A if X is a random variable from omega to something. So if A I can give information, obtain information by testing the value of matter. Okay, so let's see. Clearly, so is this a pin down partition? Well, we have to check two things. So the first thing is, is it true that if we know this piece of data and the boundary point, do we know the, 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 uh, the position? And the answer is clearly yes, by, by the geometry. 
Okay? So in this case, HB of AN given PN, well, it's just zero. It's really, <laughs> it's just one point, <laughs> you have one choice. So, right, because given psi and the N, there is only one choice for WN. That's it. The second thing is, how, how about the second thing? So is it true that if I take the entropy of this new random variable, is it true that this entropy is sublinear? Well, not necessarily. So, however, in the free semigroup, it, it's particularly nice what happens because in the free semigroup, you have a group homomorphism <laughs> from F2 plus to N. <laughs> So this is a homomorphism in this case. There is no, it just, you know, you take, take a word and this just gives you the norm of this word. This is just a homomorphism. So it's, it's very easy to, to test this condition because if we start with a measure mu on the group, we can define theta to be the push forward of mu under this projection map. And this is a measure on the natural numbers. Now, if I give you a random walk to the natural numbers, what happens to the entropy? Well, if the entropy, so the, the, the point is, if the entropy is finite, then we are in good shape, actually. So, so the, clay, the, the proposition or theorem for the position is that if the entropy of psi, so this is given, yeah, this is in our earlier paper. If this is finite, well, then if you think about it, h of Pn divided by n goes to zero, where Pn is given by the values of the distance functions. And the reason is pretty simple, because the random walk projects to another random walk. This is very, very special in this case. You have a homomorphism on the nose. And what else do we know? If we have a random walk, so the proof is, and theta is finite entropy, random walk on, on Z basically, on, on N, which is subset of Z, hence its Poisson boundary is trivial, this is an abelian group, and by the entropy criterion, if you, we can also do the computation, but let's say, the entropy criterion tells you that the boundary trivial is equivalent to this asymptotic entropy being zero. So since Poisson boundary of n or z of z is trivial, we have that h of pn over n is just h of theta the convolution, and this goes to zero. So adding the distance in this case really is harmless. But again, this only is true if the, the, the projection of the walk. So the original, uh, yeah, yeah, the original entropy could have been infinite. So for instance, this is one case where we do still know the boundary, even if the entropy is infinite, but it's a very specific case. In general, this is even on the free semi-group on two generators. This is still an open problem on, in, in general. Okay, so, so this is a somewhat the toy example. Are there questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's right. The entropy goes down. The, the entropy goes down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The entropy could be infinite on the semi-group. When you project, it could be finite. That, that, is, that is good. 
or it could still be infinite, and that is not good. Yeah, on Z, the boundary is always trivial. That's the thing, irrespective of what the entropy is. So for abelian groups, the boundary is always trivial. So this, this is why at some point I thought to have proven this other conjecture, because it seems like it. But no, you still need to be able to really talk about these partitions in a, in a meaningful way. And, and yeah, you, you need to some finiteness of the entropy of this projection. Yes, yes. Yeah. So on, on uh, this is true for the finite entropy. What the only thing I've said is in Z, we don't need the finite entropy to say anything because the boundary is always trivial. Yeah, yeah. Of course, but if the, in, the entropy is infinite, well, H will also be infinite. So, so this is uh, unrelated to whether the boundary is trivial. Yeah, so part of the non-trivial part of this type of theory is you have to convince that these problems are not trivial. <laughs> yes. And they turn out to be very subtle. Okay, so, so what about the general hyperbolic group? Well, we can definitely not do this thing and that's a clear way because, for instance, this homomorphism does, is not there. You can always consider the distance, and we will. That is an excellent suggestion that I thought about. And again, they work in, on, on the free group. You can look at some of the other quasimorphisms as well. And it would work. So you would, you would say something. But yeah. So I thought also about this way of, but it doesn't seem to be quite, quite powerful enough. The boundedness of entropy is not preserved. The entropy goes down. Yeah. The finiteness of entropy. For what? Yeah. Yeah. So if you start with a finite entropy thing and you you produce and you you run a quasimorphism, I would suspect that you still have finite entropy. Yeah. But the problem is this map is not. Yeah. So then it, this process which is induced is not a run walk. And okay, maybe it's not so bad. I mean. Probably it's like know how to deal with more complicated processes, but I don't. So, <laughs> but yeah, this this process is is not so immediate. But the good thing that we will see is that this language of partitions, instead of uh, language of uh, you know random variables, it, it's a bit more flexible. So this is somehow. Okay, so now what is the next ingredient? Now we need some geometric ingredient. And so what do we use to replace that? So fortunately, recently there was this uh, other breakthrough, which was the pivoting theory of Sebastian Guzel. So pivot theory. Oh. Is that right? <laughs> yes, so, so the, yeah, so the pivoting theory is about, uh, again, this kind of actions. I, let's say start with just hyperbolic groups and also generalizes to other group actions, but it tells you without any moment condition that the runner walk still has good geometric properties. And in fact, it could be used to, for instance, reprove what I discussed with about the convergence to the boundary without using the horror function compactification. This, and also to get more, stronger uh, deviation, uh, exponential deviation inequalities and things like this. So it's, it's pretty powerful, but we only need some actually weak, weak form of it. But okay, so, so let's start. So let, again, G be hyperbolic. And now we will fix 
some constant m, which is more or less, it's, yeah, it's exactly what, more or less what Nier was talking about. He was calling it delta, so we will call it m. So it's some constant that depends on the geometry of the group. Okay, so what is our definition of pivots, which is, again, actually simpler than Guzel's one, because we don't need the full power of it. But okay, so first of all, we have a classical notion of a shadow, SP, shadow centered at P. So P is some group element. Is the usual thing. So we fix a base point, which, okay, I guess is a group. So we can take identities and we have P. And well, the shadow is basically, you know, the, the limit set on the bound, the part of the limit set, which is in the direction of P. And so the way you usually define it is you can define it as the set of X in the group, such that if you, if you draw the geodesics from X to E, then it passes close to P, and this closeness depends on this constant. So this is more or less classical. So this is the X in G, such that the geodesic one to X passes, and where well, there's more than one, but again, everything is hyperbolic, so it's up to bounded distance, distance M of P. Okay, and so, and now we, we need this notion of pivotal times. So, so what is a pivotal time? A pivotal time is a time where, where the random walk behaves nicely in the sense that from there on, it does not backtrack before this, this pivotal time. So let me, so there's two notions. There's a finite pivotal times, and then we will see the infinite version of it. So we first, the original version is we start with some integer n. So we look at just the walk until step n. So we define pn, the set of, let's call it n pivotal times. And basically it's just the following. So, so k, an integer, between one to n. So the pn is the set of k, the times such that, well, wh belongs to the shadow, to the k shadow, to the shadow of wk for every k less than h less than n. So this is pretty intuitive. So what does it mean? It means we, we have our walk, our walk can backtrack at some point, you reach time K, this WK. So you, you don't know what, what happens before, there could be something. But then, okay, if we go forward until up to time N, so you want to know that all the next steps up to time N, they're also in the shadow of WK, so they're in the shadow. This is the shadow. So there is basically no, yeah, in this, in this interval of time, the runner walk does not backtrack past back to WK. So that is somehow a point where you can stand and support your walk from there on. So now the one thing that these pivotal times at step n is one set of times. And then at the next step, a priori, you could destroy what you did before because the random walk is allowed to backtrack. So of course, this depends on the path that will, it's a random, uh, becoming a real probabilist. I don't write dependence of omega anymore. So. So anyways, so there is another one, which is, so we can also have an infinite notion of this, which is uh, time k and n is pivotal from infinity. 
if indeed the random walk never backtracks before w, WK ever. So if for any n bigger than k, s wn, sorry, point wn belongs to the shadow of w. And this is even simpler. You don't have some finite horizon, but you have your infinite. OK, and in general, the point, if, if k is a pivotal time, the point wk is called a pivotal element. So sometimes we only record the time, and sometimes we also want to know the element. So of course, these two things are related, but there is way more information if we want to record the whole element rather than just time. So, and a simple corollary is that if k is pivotal from infinity, then, well, then you have a fellow traveling in the sense that the distance between the end step of the walk and the limiting geodesic from E to Xi, so this is limit point of Wn, well, the limiting geodesic, this is less than some constant <laughs> times m. So, okay, let's say m. This is just because you, you, you have this picture, you take the limit, and the limit, the, the limit has to lie in the, in the shadow of Wk at infinity. That's it. So, in particular, for pivotal times, the, so the way you think about pivotal times is here you have your limiting point. And at certain moments, you will be close to the geodesic. So you can do uh, some stuff. You will be close to the geodesic. And also, from there on, you always go to the right of this. So, so then you do a bunch of stuff. So you can backtrack, but not here. Backtrack a little bit. And then you have another pivotal time. So you're again close, and then from there on, yeah, you never go back to, a, to the left of this. So you can do a bunch of other stuff and so forth. And eventually, you go back. So in between pivots, the render walk is allowed to do all crazy things. We have no moment condition. So it can be very far from the geodesic. We don't really know. But the saving grace is result proof these pivots are somewhat abundant. They, they happen somehow often enough that we can use them to, to, to guide our work. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. And so, 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 so almost surely there would be. Yeah. I think so. Oh, entropy what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, so this is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But this is also part. No, I know, I know. So I, I haven't finished, but <laughs> you definitely, this is a necessary condition somehow. It's not enough. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, so let me show, yeah, let me uh, tell you what, what Guzel's lemma or theorem is. I mean, this is a somewhat a lemma in the whole long paper, but I, this is in some sense the uh, really, uh, really important point. So, we can call it, I don't know, lemma or proposition or something, which you can call abundance of pivots. This is due to Google. No. So, so here we, we, so there is one, one technical point that maybe I will gloss over is that Goodell obtains this estimates not for any measure, but he has this particular type of measure, which you can call alternating measure. So let me, so if, 
mu b an alternating measure. So this is given. Yeah, this is given as follows. It's given by, by, the, by taking a walk that has sort of two laws, one for the even steps and one for the odd steps. So this measure is obtained as something like this. So kappa is any measure. And then the next step has to be on a, a very nice measure, which is uniform on a Schottky set. So I will not define this at the moment because in the end, so there is some hyperbolicity here in the short choice of this Schottky set. But in the, in the end, we will, yeah, we don't have time to say, but we can prove that if we can identify the Poisson boundary for these alternating measures, we can identify it for all measures with, still with final measure. So at the moment, this will be a technical assumption that we, we won't really discuss, but this is one, one important idea. So the point is the following. So there exists a random variable. Let's call it u from n to z. So it could be also negative. And it, such that it has the following properties. So first of all, it has positive mean, but also it has somehow exponential moment. So there exists some t naught such that e to the minus t naught u is finite. So basically, it's, it's, a, it's a variable, basically, which is one very often. And it could be minus one, minus two, minus three, but with an exponential tail. So this is the type of variable. And it has the following such that. For every n, j, and k, the probability that the number of pivots at the step n plus j is bigger than the number of pivots at the step n plus k, this is bigger than the probability of an independent sum of random variables. So, where each ui are ID and they have the same this law. Yeah, so there is an exponential decay that Guzel can prove using this definition of pivots, which is okay, you look at the pivots at time n plus j, for instance, at times n plus one. Okay, it's very likely that you keep going forward. So the next step is number of pivots plus one. So it's very likely. However, it could be that k is negative. It could be that, in fact, you're backtracking. But how much you backtrack? Well, the amount you backtrack is bounded, in some sense, exponentially. And the precise way to say it is, is bounded by a, you know, just a, a sum of IID random variables. So basically, it's like at each step, you decide whether the next step is also pivot. More or less, this is decided by this random variable. So this will tell us that indeed the number of pivots well, it's is is somewhat somewhat large enough for our purpose. Okay, so okay, so now we are ready to to really yes. No, no. Uh, yeah, we. I get, uh, you start with the measure, and then the proposition. Yeah, gives you such a random variable. So, yeah, basically, you can think of if you have a free group. If you don't want to back, it's this idea, right? You have D possible directions. If you don't want to backtrack, you have D minus one options. And if you want to backtrack, you have one option. So this is one over D. And if you want to do it J times, it's one over D to the J. This is an extremely simplified version, but this is actually the idea.
Say it again. Yeah. 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 yeah UI is an abstract random variable. So in some sense, so you can only call. So in some sense, this. Yeah. So so. This is a probabilistic statement. So on this side, we know we are saying something about this random walk. Here we have just a probabilistic model where we randomly extract this, this yeah, somehow this, this, this uh, amount of backtracking or progress that we make in the, in the, in the J step, yeah. 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 It's quite closely related. Can I avoid for the moment, given the definition, because it's a bit of a lengthy definition. But basically, yeah, for instance, if you have a free group, you just take the standard generator. So this is a shot key. So basically, yeah, it's, it's more or less like generator of a shot key subgroup inside. Yeah, it's a ping pong. Yeah, you have, it's something where you can pay people. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's... Uh, you see, so that now we, we really can give it the start looking at the entropy. Um, yeah, entropy argument, entropy bounds. So what are the partitions? So remember, recall that uh, we have to find this partition PN. So this is the, what is the new amount of information that can help us telling where the walk is? So again, we know already the boundary point. And, okay, if we know the boundary point, immediately we know the geodesic, because this is still, you know, hyperbolic group. And then what else would help us telling, you know, knowing whether, uh, where, where are we really? For instance, if you know some tracking property, that would help us a lot, which is how the original, um, criterion works, for instance, if you know that the end step is very close to the geodesic, then you would be fine. But this we don't know in this generality. And clearly, since I introduced pivots, you can guess that pivots play a role in this uh, story. So, okay. So, first of all, okay, so we, so first of all, we chunk, we, okay, so there will be some, some, uh, um, there will be two constants. There will be some constant alpha, which eventually will be large. And so this will be used to ch give chunks, like, yeah, cut your, 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 your time in, in, in chunks. So you denote the time interval i, k alpha. Well, this is just the time interval between time alpha k minus one and alpha k between zero and n. Okay, and of course, how many such intervals we have, we have k less than n over alpha, or I don't know, ceiling or something like this. So first of all, we have our timeline, let's say, and we, we chunk it in, in intervals of the same length. And now, what do we want to know? Well, for each such interval of time, we can check whether there is, is there a pivot in this interval of time or not. And if there is a pivot, we pick the pivotal time and the pivotal element. And if not, then it's fine. Okay. So, okay, so, so let, so here we pick just TK is the following, is the time of first pivot in IK. If you see the pivot, <laughs> if you don't, well, let's say maybe minus one, you have some, some symbol if there is no pivot. <laughs> Could be. And so this defines part of our partition. So we define the partition tau, tau n, will be defined by the, our pivots, t1, t2. The last pivot, the last t would be t n over alpha. 
So this is a some finite amount of data that if you're given a path, you can check like, okay, so yeah, chat GPT, can you tell me the time for the, of the first 10 pivots? <laughs> okay, so the thing here, yeah. And also remember, we, we only take in the time, the location, we, it's, it's more information. So we don't want that. There will be too much information to ask and that would, Great, uh, too big of an entropy. So what's the next? So, but that's not enough, of course. First of all, because there could be no pivots. And second, because, uh, so remember, we need some distance thing. Okay. Okay, so, so okay. And then we, we need another constant. We need another constant, which we call L. And so this depends on alpha, but okay, this is these are two different meanings. So this is just the to avoid the steps to be too big. That's that's it. It's it's easy. And so we say we say an interval ik alpha is okay, not not is good, not very original notation. I'm sorry, if there there's two things, so one is there is a pivot. And the second is that the distance between the J step and the J minus one step. So every step in this interval is less than L. For every. So a good interval, nice, well-behaved person, there is a pivot, and also every step you take in this interval is somewhat controlled by this. Okay. And then the second piece of data that we want to define is the following. So we define the good distance. So remember, we want to keep track of the distance. And the good distance is just this, let's call it dn is the sum of the distances between pivots. So let's call it PK and PK minus one. So if both, of course, IK alpha and IK minus one alpha are good. Yeah, so PK, yeah, PK is the, is the K, is the pivot, is the kth pivot. Right, so if, if there are pivots in two consecutive intervals, you can take the distance between them and you're pretty satisfied. Why are you pretty satisfied? Well, because the pivots are close to the Judah. So remember what is the picture? You have psi, you have your somehow intervals. And suppose you have a pivot here, which is PK, uh, okay, minus one and PK. Right, if I have these two pivots, well, by the way, I don't want to know the name of the pivots. So we're not looking at which element. I, I don't want to know, <laughs> but I want to know just the distance. And this is much less information because it's just one, one integer. And so because why, why is it good? Well, because again, the pivots by definition are close yeah, this is like M, like M. And so the, you have this picture, you have a bunch of pivotal intervals, good intervals. And so this is PH minus one, PH, and you also track this once. Okay, and also I don't want to know each individual, but the total sum, so all the good ones, they're all going in the positive direction. So, you know, every guy that gives me between one and a million dollars, I don't care who gives me what, I just care about the sum. Okay. That's it, right? Okay, now the annoying part is the bad intervals. So what do we do in the bad intervals? In the bad intervals, you need some control. And in the bad intervals, 
Fortunately, the entropy, so in the bed intervals, you have no control whatsoever on the geometry. But you have very good control on the entropy, and that may be enough. So we also define the following random variable or partition, which is Bn, which is given by the following. Right. So, right. So it's B. Yeah, let me tell you what it is. BK1, BKS, where, okay. So KI, KI are bad intervals. So there are a bunch of bad intervals. And unfortunately, for the bad intervals, you have to look more closely, right? So when you have a happy pivot, you don't look too much into their life. But if you have a bad time, you want to know. They're all bad in different ways, right? So this is, this is what it is. So, so we have to keep really track of the whole path. So this is a bit annoying, but we have to because really we have no information. So when we have this bad path, we, we care. So we track of this and what, what is this B, K, I? Well, this is everything. This is like, is all the GIs, all the increments, where I, and unfortunately, we have to care about the previous one, this one, and the next one. It, it, it's not a big, such a big deal, but yeah, so, so if you have a bad interval, you want to know everything about the interval, the previous interval, and the next. It's only three times as much. So it's, Okay, and, and then, yes, so then the claim, and yeah, maybe, I, yeah, so tomorrow I can somewhat work out the, the, the final estimate, but let me say what the upshot is. Sorry? Okay, S. Yeah, S is the number of bad, of bad intervals. You see that, uh, yeah, it is some number, right? So because we, wh what does this depend on? Well, it depends on the choice of path, of course, and depends on n. So for each n, we, we do this analysis for this final chunk. But it, 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 it could be, it could vary according to the, uh, you know, according to which path you choose. But the good thing is when we phrase things in terms of partitions, if we have one random variable or two or a million of them, doesn't matter because you can always define a partition associated to them. So the number, we don't keep actual track of the number, but of course, eventually we will use Guzel's result to show that the entropy on this bad intervals is not very big. So that's, that's the option. Okay, so, so let me write down the two final claims. And yeah, and maybe we'll, Tomorrow we can see the proof of those two final claims. So the proposition, so there's two propositions. So let's call it proposition one. And so this is the pin down thing. Meaning that the data of how n, which depends on alpha. So if you, if you think about it, dn, which is this good distance, which depends on alpha and L. And then this B are these bad locations, which also depends on alpha and N. Pins down, so determines in some sense, determines the location of WN. In, in what sense? Precisely, we, we want exactly the following, that if you take the entropy conditioned on, on hitting a particular boundary point of a n, so this is the n step, remember, given that you have this tau n alpha, given that you have this good distance, and given that you have this bad intervals, this is small, in fact, it's small o of n. In fact, this o, yeah. Yeah, this O will depend on alpha. 
yeah, in fact, it does not depend on L, but it doesn't matter. So, so this, um, this is the pin down part. And maybe we can give an idea of, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe we can give the idea why, why that is true. So the idea is, yeah, you, you have this psi, you have a finite boundary point and geodesic. And so how can I tell where is WN? This is the elusive point. Well, there would be a last pivot. So the last pivot would be close to the geodesic by definition. So first of all, can we tell how, this, how, how far is the distance between the origin and the last pivot? And the answer is yes. Why? Because for the good, whenever there are pivots, P1, P2, P, P, P4, when there are pivots, we can take the distance between the pivots. And so this would be the good distance that we already have. And when we are not, um, yeah, when we're not in the good interval, well, we recorded everything in between. So if we have a gap between pivots, we recorded everything in between. So we just take the, we know all the elements, group elements. So we just take the product of them and we have the distance. So let me call it this G, PI plus plus one, G, PI minus. And this is, I is bad. So if it's a bad time, I look at, right, so T, so what is Ti plus is the last pivotal time and Ti minus is the next pivotal time. Or we can maybe say T plus. So in between, we have all the increments. We recorded them already. They're part of the data of this. Yeah. Okay, so for now, we're done. And tomorrow, we will finish with the other half of the essence. Thank you. You can because you don't you don't have a moment condition. That's the thing. So if you did have a moment condition, then you would uh, you would be able to somewhat control how. how but the, the jumps can be can be enormous. Yeah, I mean the entropy just depends on the support of of this walk. So on the weights that you give to to group elements. But you know if you have a measure on a group and then with certain entropy, you could produce a measure on the same group with the same entropy, but the, with much this larger distances just by sort of putting these weights further. So yeah, so fortunately, again, this exponential bound that, that I talked about before then would still tell you that even if we don't really control the geometry, the probability of these bad things happening is somewhat small enough. Yeah. Not yet, not yet. No, this lemma is a geometric, so to speak. The Well, it's for the whole thing to work because the criterion that we are we want to prove that this entropy goes to zero, and for the whole criterion to work, you need uh, you need finite entropy. So, yeah. 
But yeah, also for the other part, you will, you will see. <laughs> this thing? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did I say E? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I guess E uh, doesn't matter. Maybe maybe it's better to think about the norm of this. Yeah. All right. Again. Yeah. I guess it's the same. <laughs> no. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Let's. Uh, I want to say the the word the norm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's the difference between the distance? <laughs> Why wasn't it good? The DE. Yeah, I think technic. Uh, wait. Uh, yeah, technically it's it's fine actually. <laughs> but I guess you want. Yeah, you want to think is the this. You want to think of the distances between these two. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is the length of this word in, say, the word metric. Or, yeah. Say the word metric if you have a hyperbolic group, yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, that's right, but you're not recording it. Yeah, so you have to, yeah, that's right. No, no, the distance between the endpoints. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah, the previous is included. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course, if you if you needed the length of the walk, you you could get it because you you know really all the all the elements. But no, we just need that. But you need only the distance. You don't need the. Yeah, you, you will see. So what's going on, right? So I haven't finished this, this sentence, but basically, so this is the distance. So the distances tell you where the last pivot is. Because once you know the distance, again, you sum, you just go along the geodesic, and more or less, you know where you are. There's the last, there's the last bit. So we count the last interval as bad always, just <laughs> to be safe. And then here you really need the whole path because you, you really want to reach this guy. Okay, anything more? Okay, so let's thank uh, Julio.